Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about gopher conservation through education, research, and rehabilitation at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center. And the uh, Georgia Sea Turtle Center is a department of the Jekyll Island Authority. We focus on rehabilitation of ill and injured native turtles and other wildlife. And we do a lot of education with the general public, as well as training professional students, such as grad students, AmeriCorps members, and veterinary students. And we have a broad-based research program as well that includes all the areas listed there. And one of the things we're most well known for is the interconnection of all these areas, rehabilitation research and education and everything we do. And we use turtles as flagship species, flagships for the ecosystems they occur in. And one of the most unique parts about our education gallery is this treatment room window. It's very popular with our guests and they can see everything we do with the turtles from emergency care to surgery. And we can use these individual animals as flagships for the ecosystems they have current and also to um, have that individual animal represent the conservation issues of that particular species and the threats and hopefully um, give them some take home messages that they can do um, in their own uh, at, when they go home. We have a lot of gopher tortoise education programs. This is just one of them. This is called Burrow, Burrow Buddies and it talks about the commensals of the burrow as well as the gopher tortoise's natural history and can be geared towards um, kindergarten kids or up to adults. We also try to take advantage of our research. This is a relocation project that uh, Kimberly Andrews and Lance Payton um, headed up. And these are the tortoises that were being processed at the center. And uh, the public could see what they were doing. And they were able to educate people about all the different aspects of relocation. And somehow we see a lot of gopher tortoises. It's almost as many as we do sea turtles. So it's a very common species we see. And we see a lot of different problem solved go through a few of the issues. Uh, dog bites are pretty common. Usually they'll get the, the um, limbs. Here you can see a really severe injured limb. This animal was ultimately released. They oftentimes will chew on the shell and then also puncture wounds in the carapace. Um, these are some heavy machinery injuries. This one's name is chromium, came from the mine site where we're doing a relocation, um, hence the name chromium. Um, and he had heavy machinery that hit him when he was getting removed from the burrow and got sand. He went back into the burrow and got sand packed into that wound, which made it more challenging than a box turtle, not a gopher tortoise, as you know, but uh, was run over by a lawnmower, just so a good example of that. Ear abscesses are very common in box turtles, but you can see them in gopher tortoises as well. Uh, documentation here, and we basically remove all that caseous material. They don't have liquid pus like mammals because they lack the enzymes to break it down, so they have this hard pus. Um, and in box turtles, this has caused the wild box turtles, it's thought there's a correlation with high levels of organochlorines and ear abscesses. And organochlorines inhibit vitamin A synthesis. And in captivity, um, the cause of the ear abscesses are um, vitamin A deficiency. But in the wild, there is a correlation with organochlorines. So that's kind of interesting. We see uh, thin tortoises coming in. Sometimes it's starvation. We presented two years ago about the Negosi mortality event, which ended up turning about to be that just starvation from social stresses, um, but it can have other reasons. So this particular animal had a liver abscess. Only way you're gonna figure this out is either through a necropsy or scoping the animal and looking at the liver directly with, a, with an endoscope, which we can do. And again, they have this very hard caseous <coughs> material instead of pus. So that's what those abscesses are made of. Mycoplasma, of course, is something we might get a hit, hit by car case and have a tortoise with develop mycoplasma or come in with mycoplasma. So it's something that we always have to keep our eyes on as far as quarantine and other things. This was another series of cases from uh, Fort Stewart where they were having real thin animals and it turned out a lot of those animals had fungal pneumonias. We also had indigos in those same burrows that had the same fungal pneumonia. So there was some back and forth with commensals on that situation, which is kind of interesting. But by, you know, the most common thing we see in freshwater turtles, terrapins, and and terrestrial turtles is automobile morbidity and mortality. It's one of the most important conservation issues that affect turtles as well as other wildlife, as all of you know. Um, one of the first things we do when an animal comes in is do a thorough physical exam, head to, head to tail or from the start, start from the front and go to the back. And one of the easiest things you can do is watch the animal walk. And you can see that this animal's lifting itself up, it's moving all four limbs, 
and it's got its head up, normal mentation, whereas this tortoise is eating. He had been treated for a while for a really severe carapace injury. We knew he had a spinal injury, but obviously he's um, not moving those back legs normally, so that means he's probably going to not be releasable. So it's important to consider those before you start your therapy. If you're going to do triage and euthanize the animal, it's better to do it sooner than later. A little bit about our medical support, wound care, and fracture repair. Um, nutritional support is one of the most important things we do. We want to get these animals eating, so we try to provide them a, a decent environment, more naturalistic environment to get them eating. Um, they love to be outside, so getting them outside is really important, but sometimes with the wounds we see, we can't put them outside. We may have to tube feed them. If their head's really hard to get out, we can use a feeding tube, and these are really nice feeding tubes because you can adjust, it, adjust the size, and it has different tips, feeding tips depending on how you're, uh, what kind of syringe you're using. And then we use a lot of bone cement. You can put antibiotics in it or not. Sometimes we'll use it as a primary repair if the fracture is stable. Um, other times we'll use this red heel, which is a borate bioglass that reacts quickly with body fluids and stimulates the generation of new blood vessels. And it improves the blood supply of the wound, which is typically what we're trying to do is just um, increase wound decrease the time of wound healing and get these animals out back out in the wild. And we can use the bone cement to cover this um, to protect it. But the, Ready heels put directly on the wound. This is Tucker, who you'll be hearing a lot about in this talk. Uh, he's now famous. Um, but we use screws and wires um, and wound care on this animal. You can see the, the screws and wires are here. They have a marine epoxy over top of them to protect them and keep the sharp points of the wire from getting caught on things. And then also have lung exposed here where we use the wound back. This is the therapeutic laser where we're um, Therapeutic laser will increase the energy of the cell, increase the blood supply of the cell, and increase decrease wound healing time. Here we're putting on a silver mesh material that lasts for about 72 hours, and then a foam that's used for wound back therapy as a special pore size that distributes the vacuum that you'll see in a minute throughout the wound, and that's what adds, that's how the wound heals. Here we're just cutting the cutting it, uh, um, working very quickly here as you can see. Um, and uh, putting, putting uh, the sticky bandage on. We get all these supplies from nurses and hospitals for free because um, they're very expensive. And you can see I've gotten very good at this. Um, and we put a quarter size hole in the, in the sticky bandage and then put our suction apparatus and then um, go to our wound back, which is battery powered. We get this donated from the company. We have three machines are usually going on. Uh, we usually have them working um, full time uh, all the time. So. Um, what this does, it creates negative pressure, which increases blood flow to the wound, removes that uh, infection or exudate, removes fluid or edema, and then promotes the healthy tissue, granulation tissue, and also bring the lung back into the wound, which a lot of times will collapse. If you have an open body cavity, this is a perfect um, treatment for open body cavity wounds. And then the turtles can, the tortoises can go outside, they can move around their pen, they can get sunlight. Enjoy, and this guy's going for a walk, so he's enjoying the day on his walk. So it's portable. Um, these are other challenging wounds when you have the skin separate from the shell, so we develop a technique where we use bra hooks um, and epox them on, and then suture, use them to suture the skin to the bra hooks. And that is very helpful in that situation. Zip ties can be used. We use these zip tie bases, and then two zip ties to repair simple fractures. This is uh, screws and wires, so just putting in screws and then a figure eight uh, wire, and then we'll put on the marine epoxies that I talked about earlier. This is actually chromium, who I talked about earlier, which was from the mine site, um, and that's used to stabilize that fracture. And then that's the ready heel. It looks like blue cotton candy, but it's expensive, so we don't need it. And then uh, the, bone, the bone cement placed on it. And we'll go through a couple of cool cases. Dan, um, it's an adult, adult male gopher tortoise, had a carapace fracture after being hit by a car, gave him fluids, antibiotics, pain management, used meloxicam and tramadol usually, and then tube feeding, so he didn't get a feeding tube, he was pretty easy to pull his head out. And then we stabilized the fracture with a variety of methods. As you can see here, it had a very deep wound going into the body cavity, so we used the wound back, also had screws and wires, and uh, bone cement and ready heel. Um, this is Dan at St. Catharines, our sister island, where we release a lot of tortoises that are wave tortoises are single animals. You can see he's enjoying his last meal and he's all healed up and ready to go. 
And then plaster on fractures can be very difficult to repair. This is Keystone, and um, we're using the zip ties, red heel bone cement on this. And you can see that it peeled up. It's not real attractive for the women, but they don't really care. So um, it's, it's not cosmetically beautiful, but it's functional. That's what we're trying to get. This is a current case, Mosey, who has a bridge fracture, which are really hard to heal. He had two open areas to the stomach cavity, so we used the wound back. We built up the sides of the wound with a red heel bone cement. And we also had a feeding tube in place for about two months, and then she pulled it out and started eating. So that's usually how we know. You can see the, the ready heel and the silver mesh for the wound back. So this case is still in progress. Um, this is chromium. Talked about him earlier. You can see the original fracture and then him being released. So happy at his new, new site at Penn Holloway from the mine site. Um, this is Tucker again, the famous Tucker being a nest hive for. He had hit by car, but also a big bladder stone. It was a one kilo bladder stone that we had to get out. So he's being a nest yes. hive. That's our rehabilitation um, manager. And you see that he's got a Doppler monitoring the anesthesia. We get a series of injections to get the animal out, then intubate and put him on isochlorine gas anesthesia. And this is Tucker being prepped for his bladder stone removal. We ended up trying to go through the inguinal area in front of the back leg, but we couldn't get to it. So we had to resort to going through the shell and making a flap. So we'll uh, make an incision with a bone saw and then use a uh, hammer and chisel to get through the rest of it, put it at an angle so it doesn't fall into the body cavity, make an incision into the slumbic lining, then put some stay sutures on the bladder. This is in fast motion, by the way, so I can get through this out. Uh, suction fluid out, um, get the stone out. This is uh, like piece of material around the stone, and this is only a tenth of the stone. So there's a one kilo stone um, that we removed and um, suturing the bladder back up and, and then suturing the salomic lining, putting the bone flap back on. Then we used the red heel bone cement again and um, fiberglass over top of that that stayed on for five months and then was pulled off. We used, as I said, St. Catharines for releasing a lot of these animals, so that's been great. It's also adding new genetics to the relocated population there. We're starting to put transmitters on these tortoises. So this is a, just a fun video. We had to, had to pick a lot of it out, but this is Tucker with his last meal actually um, going out and he was really charging the food and um, <laughs> it's a lot better once he got into once he got to St. Catherine. And this is uh, Tucker's wound, you saw it earlier. It's all healed up and nice and that's his wound on his oh, shell, the square, good. all healed up and um, all the women love him now. <laughs> and this is Tucker being released and um, and he has a transmitter on and um, going into his burrow, stayed there for about a day, and then started trucking out into the woods, and he got back, got an ocean view now, um, so he's overlooking the ocean. Um, so Janie Gaskin tracked him and was able to find him, but she had to go through the woods, about a half a mile of woods to get to him. Um, our go course research is fairly extensive. We have a lot of work going on our sister island. Tracy Tuberville has been heavily involved with that over the years. We've done Head Start research with St. Catharines, and uh, Tracy and Dan, um, Quinn, who's here today, um, the Dosey Plantation Mortality Event we presented on a couple years ago, and Becca Kosad, who couldn't make it, was heavily involved with that. Um, and then we have this relocation health assessment project from the mine site in Charleston and Brantley counties uh, to Penn Holloway. And this is just uh, Dan, the title of the dance, one of his chapters, um, which was basically to, we, we looked at it as getting back to the state. We, um, raised a lot of these tortoises for about nine months, and then Dan was able to release them on the Yucky Wildlife Management Area. And this was the Negosi mortality event. Um, basically, we came up with the, it started out by Dan, or uh, Matt Oresco calling me to ask what antibiotics should I use on this tortoise that was, and then it evolved into this huge project, and eventually I realized that it was gonna need to be um, more involved. We did manage a lot of these cases and got them turned around and released them back to Negosi. Um, and Becca, who couldn't be here today, um, did her master's um, on this project and was able to do some disease investigation, found uh, ranovirus in a number of the tortoises, but they were not clinically affected. And then uh, basically it came down to the, we think this is overcrowding and social stresses. But cool thing is Becca now has a full-time job. Dan and Becca were both uh, AmeriCorps members with our program and went on to graduate school. And the last one uh, was uh, Lance Payton, who was a AmeriCorps member as well and went on to graduate school and this relocation health assessment project, which Kimberly Andrews, our former ecologist, headed up with Lance um, doing his master's on. 
So that's all I had. Um, probably no time for questions, but I think I did get it in 15 minutes anyway. <laughs>